Insane ramblings. Myths are necessary. So are man-made disasters. Natural disasters bring people together without need for contrivance. Man-made disasters, wars, plots, scandals, inquisitions, dilemmas of all, self-sustained, for they are essential to man's emotional needs. They are narcotic. The mob requires regular doses of scandal, paranoia, and dilemma to alleviate the boredom of a meaningless existence. What begins as a seedling of reality germinates into a full-blown myth, which in turn picks up constituents along the way who confer substance to it. One morning in the sixth decade of the 20th century of the Common Era, a sanctified leader was assassinated under circumstances that observers, both learned and casual, were convinced bore political significance. A large-scale conspiracy was presumed. In reality, the master of a sect of the Knights Templar, an inquisitor general, engineered the sacrifice in accordance with a tradition demanding a threefold sacrifice to avenge a grave injustice. The inquisitor general took the rights of Hiram seriously and brooded upon the dynastic rule of Pope Clement and Philip the Fair, which in the 14th century tortured and burned alive the man who held his corresponding office. The Inquisitor General knew that those who stood for all he despised had caused the death of a fair and exalted damsel, one whose demise had killed more than a small part of his alter ego. To add insult to injury, the murder of the angel from the abyss was sanctioned by one who would usurp his inquisitor's throne, if permitted. In his mind dwelt the essence of de Molay, just as others have harbored within themselves the engrams and cellular memory of kindred ones who have gone before. Crazy? Of course. Only small and insignificant men are supposed to harbor such quirks. The great are thought to be immune to folly. The moderately wise man knows different. He knows that we are all crazy, but stronger personalities shall shelter more elaborate grotesqueries. And the strongest men cry in secret and hurt inside the most. In this entire world of sham and fakery, there is no greater truth. On that day, in the month of November, the monarch, whose revels had prompted the death of the exalted damsel, rode through the crowd in his papal chariot. The monarch, whose rebels were unlike those so charitably attributed to him, and whose gaiety was unbridled. The thronging mob was long amassed before the green and capering upon the knoll. That morn, a secret password moved from lips to waiting ears. A fifth of Hiram Walker for Tubal Cain to toast the morning star. A fifth of Hiram Walker was delivered, and a volley of shots rode the wind that tramps the world. And then the rose, which had been over one hundred years dead, began to bloom anew. Verily, it grew with each succeeding sacrifice, until, unrecognized, it might depose the sterile virgin and softly glow as the rose of the world. And the Grand Inquisitor, the Emperor of the Hidden Realm, sensed that unfoldment, and bore himself nigh unto the Kingdom of Shadows, that he might culminate his threefold retaliation. Having wreaked his prime vengeance in Dallas, a time passed until the second tribute was exacted in that very city from where she was taken. And with the second, Azrael came forth out from the east to bear the sin for the mob. Shortly er thereafter, as the earthlings approached the moon, a dark portent on that very eve didst verify the third impending doom. A comely maid who deigned to dally with a blighted consort perished neath the murky waters. 
The Grand Master of the Assassins, having witnessed the certitude of his vindication, then departed his office and moved into the deepest of all night. And hard by his departure swelled a clamor, and a war ended. Yet still the mob cried for blood. And now the mouth of my raving approaches its own dear tail, and its jaws snap hungrily to grasp that barbed appendage. Myth, cries the mob. Give us myth! A still, small voice is heard among them that whimpers, cajoling. Truth, make the myth be true. But a deafening roar ascends, reiterating, elaborating. Tell us a scandal of mafia and CIA, of Watergate, and chaos and assorted crises, of shortages and impeachments and silent deaths by secret means. Frighten us with depression and inflation and the impending collapse of social structures and economic extinction. Tell us of police states and Cromwell reborn. Terrify us. Worry us. Tell us. I have told enough for one night. The dawn is breaking. You have had enough scandal to think about. But remember, all this is madness. Law of the Trapezoid We all react to what we see. Just as sounds and odors influence our behavior, so do visual patterns and shapes. Some make us feel good. Others disturb us. Whether you like to admit it or not, the fear response is the one most easily aroused. Since self-preservation is nature's highest law, fear motivates. Hence, we give our attention first to sensory impressions that represent things that we once, far back in a racial memory, feared. Fear is the prime mover. Fear of failure, fear of lack of recognition, identity, acceptance... Fear of loneliness, rejection, annihilation, the unknown. These persist well after the fundamental fears of starvation, harsh elements, and other more obvious physical fears have been pushed deep into our subconscious. If we did not fear the passage of time and death, nothing much would get done. Any shape or spatial concept that triggers fear could therefore be considered evil. Yet without such evil there could also be no progress, only complacency and stagnation. Needless to say, the fearsome is also fascinating and awesome. What shapes intensify fear? Those which are overbearing, unbalanced, jagged, confusing. The reason a triangle or pyramid in its perfect form is pleasing is because it is complete, like the imaginary vanishing points in drawings. A lot has been written about Egyptian pyramids. Here is why. 1. They are awesome because they are so big, but are pretty because they are in perfect form. 2. They are Egyptian, and the Egyptians were supposed to be smart fellows. 3. A lot of questions and theories can be connected with them. Statements number 1 and number 2 are easy to understand. Statement number 3 presents great riddles, like... Question. Why were pyramids built in that shape? Answer. Because they looked good that way and could be built as big as a monarch desired without fear of toppling over. Question. Why were they built? Answer. Pyramids were the WPA programs of ancient Egypt. People had to be kept busy during slack periods and monumental egos had to be served. Had there been radio or TV, small monuments would have been built. Question. What can they tell us? Answer. That people were pretty much the same then as they are now. That the way a pyramid looks doesn't really upset anybody except conspiracy theorists. Put the same shape in a contiguous row and you get an unconsciously scary image. Like the teeth of a saw or shark. Or the ridge on a dragon's back. The pyramid range also disturbs since it has no single vanishing point. Triangles, which are imperfect, are also disturbing, especially in groups.
The most disturbing shape of all is a trapezoid in its myriad form. A perfect trapezoid is a frustrated pyramid. In fact, the place where a pyramid or triangle is lopped off to make a trapezoid is actually called the frustum. A trapezoid says to the unconscious, I am here, solid as can be, more massive than an ordinary block, but something's missing, and it bothers you. Of course, you know what's missing. A triangular top. Like the one with the eye on the back of a dollar bill. Don't let that little pyramid with the bright eye fool you. That's, your, that's to draw your attention away from the real thing. The big trapezoid beneath it. All competent magicians are masters of misdirection, and the masons who designed the seal knew a thing or two. Angles are space planes that provoke anxiety. That is, those not harmonious with natural visual orientation will engender aberrant behavior. Exceptions occur where a sort of reverse polarity exists in a creature. Extreme mental imbalance or perversity, or perhaps even extreme rationality and awareness. I've always been interested in alleged haunted houses, strange places where unease was present, where murders and suicides were frequent, uninhabitable but seemingly innocuous areas and buildings, abodes of consistent failure to dwellers or occupants whose lives had previously been tranquil. Since my earliest years, I've been drawn to such places, curious of their origins and circumstances associated with them. I was fascinated by scenes of Mayan and Aztec temples, of oil drilling rigs, of trestles and wartime bunkers too. The old-style coffin, like an elongated hexagon, the 1936 cord sedan, the baguette diamond, the slanted blade breaking the symmetry of the guillotine. During the course of investigating alleged haunted houses or blighted areas, I soon dismissed the prevailing superstition, i.e., a deceased person's spirit restlessly hanging about. It occurred to me that even if a living entity's violent or tragic demise provoked a haunting, perhaps the house itself was the catalyst for their misfortune. It seemed that the physical environment itself played a major role. The place either catalyzed or intensified all acts committed in its precincts. I was led to contemplate the common denominator that all sites of outre or disturbed behavior possessed. In each case, angles were present that violated either topographical or architectural symmetry and perfection. Comfortable or psychologically secure configurations were either lacking or subservient to planes that inspired hostility and fear. I examined files of cases dealing with structures supposedly haunted or cursed with continuing failure, death, financial loss, insanity, fire, tragedy. Many were visually aberrant in the most flagrant manner. Others were not. A mansard roof is de rigueur in every artist's conception of the haunted house. Why did the artist automatically render them in that fashion? Good fairies' castles were all depicted as having peaked towers and gently rounded arches. Jolly elves lived in cottages with rounded corners and cake icing roofs. The good folk dwelt in Graustarkian tranquility, in snug and womb like homes with curly cues cut into the shutters. Bluebeards and Frankensteins all lived in stark, monolithic, and grotesquely bastioned abodes. Frankenstein created change and reaction by duplicating God's handiwork. The Architecture of War Medieval Storming Towers, the Martello Towers on the English Coast, and the Latter-day Mystery Towers resting on the sea bottom offshore, the Maginot and Siegfried Lines, 
the Manzi submarine sheds, pillboxes, bunkers, tank traps, the, defect, the deflective sloping sides of armored vehicles and turrets, gas chambers, atomic reactors, and the very lava stone marker in the desert where the first atomic bomb was exploded. War creates change. The mad buildings and the works of the painters of reaction, Bruegel and Bosch, the erratic sets in the shower filming of Germany, Caligari, Nosferatu, II, Metropolis, the bizarre staging of Ninjinsky's superhuman capering, the truncated volcanic eminence from which Disney produced Chukart, Infantasia's Night on Bald Mountain, the architecture of the Bauhaus, of Gropius and Polzig, and Frank Lloyd Wright, the cursed pioneer whose houseboy went berserk at Taliesin and killed seven persons and set fire to the house exactly when the construction of Wright's first excursion into trapezoidal design was completed. The ill-fated Midway Gardens Resort of Chicago. Art creates change. The altars of violence and sacrifice. The temples of the Maya and Aztec magicians formed of trapezoids and sustained by the sacrificial blood of the Chosen Ones. The truncated pyramids upon which the hearts were cut from living victims and held aloft and hot to Quetzalcoatl and Hopikern. The same temples made visible in the striations of the Mitchell Hedges crystal skull. The citadel of Iskandawaya in Bolivia, which was autonomously satanic. The necropoly of skull cults of Neolithic cultures. Lepensky Vir in Serbia, with every building in the settlement trapezoidal in form, as it was at Hasselar in Turkey, and Jericho in Jordan. The same area of the world where the Yazidi Towers of Satan beamed forth their influence, and the tower in Lovecraft's Haunter of the Dark, wherein the shining trapezohedron beams its influence and the great old ones from the brine hearken and send forth their earthly emissary, the literary rites of Huxley and Lovecraft and Orwell, and the devastation brought forth by the Angles, in Frank Belknap's Long Hounds of Tindalos, do the rites, in fact, of Quetzalcoatl and Hopikern and Mendes join the rites in fantasies of writers who know not the substance of their own mediumship? In 1962, I isolated my suppositions and distilled them into what I termed the Law of the Trapezoid. I had ample evidence that spatial concepts were not only able to affect those who were involved in visual confrontations, but far more insidiously, other parties with whom a viewer came into contact. As in any form of contagion, family, friends, and co-workers are affected by signals of anxiety projected by another. The most tranquil and stoical person can be drawn into a chaotic situation if his surroundings are sufficiently disturbing. Often I discover that subtle aberrations had a more profound effect than readily recognizable and overt spatial distortions. A room apparently perfect in its rectangular form would be a habitual scene of violence. Other rooms in the same building would be conspicuous because of their lack of disturbance. The mad room would be discovered to have one wall slightly off vertical a small weight on a string suspended from where the wall and ceiling joined would often rest well away from the baseboard. The other walls might be in perfect alignment. In such cases, I often noticed that the aberrant wall had been painted a different color or wallpaper, the occupant being unconscious of why. An aberrant area in a room might also contain articles or furniture held in less favor 
than other belongings. When an, where an entire building would be blighted, it would either have rooms replete with odd and obtuse angles, useless or impractical L's or nooks, assailing occupants from within, or else an erratic, asymmetrical, or foreboding exterior, affecting those who entered and left the premises on a regular basis or lived in visual proximity. In many examples, a structure would appear to be crouching, almost like some strange beast waiting to spring, yet not be seen as such by multitudes. Other buildings hinted at faces. On the cliffs at the end of Manhattan near the cloisters is a house that, when viewed from the river, resembles a skull. It is so obvious that any adverse effect is negated, relegating it to a charming eccentricity. Likewise, a wildly distorted house in Beverly Hills known as the Witch's House is so overt in its grotesquerie that it elicits enthusiasm rather than unconscious revulsion. Contrast such structures with others whose physical aspect is actually disturbing, but architecturally or orthodox. The John Hancock Center in Chicago looms like a Martin Sentinel on its black splendor, its sloping sides and dark color presenting a brooding spectacle with its twin devil horns slash antennae bisecting its top and continuing the frustum up and away into the sky. That its history is already grim is, to me, quite understandable. A newer and far madder building is San Francisco's Hyatt Regency Hotel at the foot of California Street. The Art Deco treatment of the Golden Gate Bridge provides a streamlined distraction from its hidden angles of unrest and the invisible trapezoid formed by an imaginary line between the towers and each end of the roadbed. With its orange-red color of madness glinting in the setting sun, it has attracted a record number of suicides, rivaled by few other places in the world. I find it interesting that most of the jumpers depart from areas near the bridge towers, the foci of the trapezoid, where its influence from within its precincts is most strongly manifested. There are objects, too, whose presence in an area continually affects those in attendance. The shape of a piece of furniture, the configuration of a painting, a mural, an appliance, certain jinxed automobiles, the angles inherent in all coffins, viewing them either from the top or from the end. Natural formations in the terrain of land areas or inadvertently aberrant landscaping can cause emotional imbalance and ensuing acts of violence. Anxiety producing spatial dimension combined with an attendance of disturbed individuals can add up to a wood filled with both psychotics and Reiki and DOR orgone starvation or life-consuming atmospheric malignancy. If the law of the trapezoid is known, recognized when applicable, and either heated or utilized, it will save much hardship and tragedy while still serving as a catalyst for change. Like fire, its powers are twofold, depending on how it is applied. Like the sun, its powers are twofold, depending on whether a thing is growing, grown, or dying. And like the first crystalline fusion of atoms, it will be the beginning and the end, the alpha and omega of all matter. Avert your gaze from the pyramids and look to the trapezoid, and you shall be moved. Two wrongs make a right. If a wrong is gotten away with, and someone else repeats it and also gets away with it, a right is birthed into existence. The wrong becomes righter each time it succeeds. Inasmuch as victors always assume historical rights, it can't be any other way. This is not to imply that anything becomes intrinsically noble through repetition, 
Only that successive acceptance of anything confers rectitude. There is no such thing as moral right. There is only true right. The balance of natural law, lex talionis, versus acquired right, bestowed by popular consensus and usage, the rules of the game. Morality is a human invention conferred by the self-serving interests of the sensuality impoverished. We must constantly confront decisions of whether to live by the law or by the rules of the game. Either way will be right. Of the two, I always prefer the way of the law, but it is often riskier and more brutal. The latter, beating them at their own game, requires more planning, time, strategy, and money. That's why, in all issues enforced by false moralisms and specious rules of the game, but unfettered by legalities, I apply my own rule, which is, there are no rules. If you create a new rule and it takes hold, you have made a right for yourself, however self-serving. Whatever prevails, overwhelms, holds in thrall, disarms, terrifies, frightens, controls, constrains, enslaves, or otherwise contributes to a man's masochistic needs will always be accepted as right. No amount of lip service to the contrary can eradicate what the past has proven and the present intensifies. If a thing or an act is naturally wrong, a Satanist will try, albeit secretly, to lend nature a helping hand, as circumstance permits. Summertime Summertime and the living is lousy. I hate summer and I'm not alone. Summertime in urban areas is riot time, tourist time, pollution time, and psycho time. In rural areas, it's mosquito time, sunburn slash heat stroke time, pollen time, litter time, boredom time, vandal time, and gangbang time. There's no worse time for tragedy than the sticky heat of summer or for frantic attempts at pleasure. Christmas joy in an odious duty, but summer gaiety is a maladroit ritual performed with calculated chaos. Persons or refinement prefer the other seasons, which progress through their days less heavy-footedly. Despite nature's tantrums during other seasons, be they storms, flood, ice, or snow, man has made summer his personal disaster season. Taking the warmth nature has provided, he has fashioned for himself an environment where his mindlessness flourishes most. It is the only season with which validates slobs. Those who have found civilized behavior repugnant the rest of the year can celebrate their boorishness in grand style. I would enjoy spring more were it not for the impending plague of summer with its human locusts thriving in an atmosphere far deadlier, if radiation levels are considered, than the worst blizzards. Other seasons may be violent in themselves, but summer is virulent, an incubator for personal malaise and discord. I like autumn and winter best. A sunny autumn day has a relaxed purity, a mellow tranquility. As with the ancients, my autumn runs from August through October, and winter from November to February. My favorite aspect of summer is that on the solstice, the f days finally grow shorter and the nights longer. The best thing about any day is this gentle lapse into the night, the dark mantle whence all secrets evolve. Wintertime is hell for many, and understandably. It's a Tartarus that causes havoc. But within a snug harbor, winter can be the great season of contrast. 
In my noir world, the sticky glare of summer has no place, save for those parts of the world where nature has cheated humankind by injecting regional and regular fog and rain. An ardent supporter of controlled environments, many years ago I fashioned a room, a true ritual chamber, which I call the Cornell Woolrich Memorial Hotel Room. It could as easily have been named the Ouija Room or the Reginald Marsh Room. It consists of an exact duplication of a seedy hotel room in an old but still sound brick building. The walls are papered with faded yellow daisies and a bluish carpeting clashes pleasantly with the brindle-colored woodwork. Outside the single window, it is always night and always raining, and an intermittent flash of a neon sign pulsates, and on a butt-scarred mahogany bureau, an old veneered radio plays songs of lost love and after-the-war dreams. The wood-grained metal bed upon which I rest bears the inevitable chintz spread, and a nightstand supports a lamp and ancient portable typewriter and the artwork. Framed prints of sad flowers trying to look cheery, a musty landscape with leaden sky, the casino at Catalina Island, and a Moran cowgirl sitting on the corral fence. A few clothes, vintage, hang on wire hangers on wire hooks, and on one dangles the obligatory shoulder holster. Above all, the fragrance of every such room that ever was mingles with the sweet scent of the wet pavements beyond. I have shown this room to a few. The famous or notorious love it and understand it and want to spend a night or more. The pretentiously unaware are repelled, sickened, and cannot get out soon enough, which suits me fine. The mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. John Milton, Paradise Lost How to Become a Werewolf The Fundamentals of Lycanthropic Metamorphosis Their Principles and Application Anyone is a potential werewolf. Under emotional stress, civilized human qualities regress to basic animal reaction, and a threshold of potential physical change is reached. Temperament People who normally behave in a coarse and boorish manner would be thought to be bordering on an animal state, hence making a complete transition relatively effortless. This is a fallacy, for churls consider themselves as humans the highest and most noble of any form of life. They are almost animals all of the time, so they dare not go over the brink, for that would be abhorrent. One who has only risen to the curbstone dares not return to the gutter. Only the higher man can metamorphose, as his ego will allow him to go all the way. He knows he is circumspect and cultured the greater part of his life, so a transition to animalism can be entertained without compunction. Manifestations of this phenomenon are abundant. The most polished individuals become the most degraded when the proper opportunity presents itself. There is no drunk quite so sloppy as a rich drunk. Analogies of such polarities are endless. Drunk is a lord, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Count Dracula, Jack London, etc. In virtually every literary stage or motion picture treatment, the lycanthrope is in his normal state depicted as a human of warmth, understanding, sensitivity, and intelligence. 
The three principal emotions of sex, sentiment, and wonder may be considered as triggering mechanisms, as will be shown by the following formula, by which one can affect change from man into beast. Environment Everyone has, at some time or other, wandered into an area of such foreboding that it is felt that someone or something is lurking in the shadows, watching, ready to spring and devour. Perhaps it was a deserted house. Perhaps a lonely path through the trees. Possibly an abandoned quarry. In many cases, it is known or discovered that such areas have witnessed death of an unexpected or unusual nature or perhaps mayhem, rape, or other violence. All actions involving intense or increased production of adrenaline on the part of either victim or perpetrator, lost terror, aggression, defense, etc., is followed by detumescence in the form of varying degrees of receptivity, shock, total submission, unconsciousness, death, etc., the polarity that such an atmosphere has undergone can be likened to an area where a heavy concentration of electricity has accumulated and discharged repeatedly, thereby recycling the ionization of the atmosphere in a chaotic and disturbing manner. The initial charge and attraction of such an area proceeds from its spatial and geometric pattern. This can be likened to an existing feeding trowel to which animals come from miles around and dine on the carcasses of their predecessors. The sadomasochistic dichotomy, with its, note, with its needs for expression, keeps such an area well stocked with both hunters and hunted. The hunted are drawn to such a spot because of the frightening yet submissive thrill obtained from the environment. Predators then come forth, drawn by the ideal hunting conditions and abundance of game. Often, however, the hunters have not originally entered the preserve as hunters, but as fear-inspired searchers after thrills. If this appears far-fetched, consider a phenomenon common to children on Halloween or on any other night where the setting is right. The child deliberately goes out expecting to be scared, succeeds in being scared, then considers how much fun it might be to scare others once he has been purged of his fear needs. He then becomes the hunter, and the next child who comes along is his quarry. The entire phenomenon is, equip is akin to a recognized psychological manifestation of those who outwardly fear a situation while at the same time doing all in their power to encourage its occurrence. Preparation The children's Halloween game gives us the clue to the role change necessary in lycanthropic metamorphosis. Briefly, it is thus. Enter the area you know to be trauma-producing with the fullest intention of being frightened. Allow yourself to be frightened. If necessary, wear articles of clothing conducive to the most submissive or vulnerable image. Accidental victims are always thus attired. Get the feel of the place as a victim, allowing yourself to be frightened as much as you can. If you can supplement your fear with a sexually stimulating feeling, so much the better. Allow yourself to virtually shake apart with fear, and if possible, attain an orgasm by whatever means may be necessary, for this will make your subsequent lycanthropic changeover easier. After you have released all fear and fled the scene of your terror slash ecstasy, go home and ruminate over what you felt. You will soon discover that a sort of magnetic pull will manifest itself, beckoning you back to the blighted spot. This uneasy attraction will increase with each succeeding day, ideally bordering on compulsion. When you find yourself unable to resist the temptation to return to your danger spot, Repeat the first incident in much the same manner. You will find the second foray into the area even more profound than the first, due to the anxiety and anticipation that has developed over the past days. 
In the truest sense, you have been performing a ritual of sending forth your energy into a living, breathing environment. That environment, because of continual taxation upon its vitality, acts as a vampire, absorbing energy from those it attracts and, once having attracted, contagiously ensnares for future sustenance. Wilhelm Reich called such areas DOR, indicating a persistent starvation of orgone or innervation of the atmosphere. Such areas are atmospherically hungry and in their barrenness cry out to be fed. All alleged haunted house and terror spots are reinforced by the accumulation of energy supplied them by the anxieties of occupants and anticipation of visitors to return, i.e. the obsessive thoughts of those who have been affected. The second time you enter your chosen area, you may not be able to spend as much time as the first, owing to your increased fear and subsequent need to quickly exercise slash exorcise it and remove yourself. At this point, you are prepared for the metamorphosis, unless you find the second time a charm and crave to entertain your fears to greater and more ecstatic heights, in which case you either haven't scared yourself enough or else there is little chance for role change. In other words, before you can become the hunter, you must first have aroused and then exercised a need to be the victim. If you are a habitual victim, it is wise to proceed, proceed with caution. Your desire to be frightened and its ensuing manifestations could impel you into a situation whereby you could be severely injured or killed. If, however, you are able to meet your fright needs and exercise them, then go on to the next step. Metamorphosis Attire yourself in the manner conducive to the change that is to be effected. Legends of berserkers donning the skins of wolves and bears hold substantial meaning in view of the importance of costume and ritual. Dress in the most stereotyped, corny manner, as the second skin that you wear is a potent element in complete transmogrification. This is hermetic or sympathetic magic exemplified as above, so below. If you wear the mask of the wolf or the skin of a beast, it is preferable if it is not genuine, as you can better infuse a facsimile of the chosen animal with your own personality while drawing from the known attributes of the species represented. The skin or mask will serve as a catalyst, a blueprint, for what you will become as you merge with it. Enter the blighted area with eager anticipation. When you approach the spots where you would have previously been the most frightened, allow yourself to revel in the thought of how terrifying it would be to another if they were to feel the same fear you had felt, plus the added terror with an actual manifestation of an unfamiliar and grotesque creature. In short, it is now your role to contribute to the fearsomeness of the place. The stage has been set and all necessary components have been activated. You have experienced intense fear. Now it is your turn to manifest intense fearsomeness in the form of bestiality. Allow yourself to slouch, almost dropping down on all fours at times. Children are quite proficient in their approximations of animals. Remember when? You've also romped on all fours with dog or cat, no doubt. Did you ever consider the implications? Sniff the air, savoring it, and the smells of the environment in which you stand. If there are trees around, get close to them, touching them, pawing them, climbing and shaking them. Do everything possible to emulate an animal. If you are in a building, urinate against the wall or on the floor. Remember, wild creatures are not housebroken. Snort, snarl, roar, grunt, make all the unsavory sounds you want. As you progressively become more imbued with the sensations of being an animal, 
you will actually feel certain areas of your body responding in a manner alien to the human anatomy. Your legs will become haunches. Your arms will become forelimbs for claws or paws that crave to grasp at the nearest thing. Your countenance will change. Your facial muscles will begin to twitch in bestial grimaces. All of your senses will become more acute. You will feel the need to urinate more frequently. You will become fascinated with the moon, especially if it is full. If you are indoors, you will seek to explore behind things, into cracks below boards. You will feel a desire to snuffle into closed areas, burrowing your head and body. If you feel a sexual desire, it will be in a rapacious manner. And if you should perceive another person who might normally appear sexually to you, the nature of your transformation will make up for their lacking attributes. The impulse to attack will be present, but your higher mind must refrain, taking over and holding you in your spot, while still allowing you sufficient impetus to release yourself. This is a stage of transformation where control is essential, unless one is with a willing partner who can enter the game as the hunted and revel in their roles. If this is the case, then complete sexual assault can be manifested. If not, sufficient restraint to attain sexual release without an attack upon the victim must be exercised. At the moment of orgasm, a complete irrevocable encompassing of the animal within must occur. With whatever abandon to this level may ensue, it is at this time that the change will take place, and if one should be unfortunate or fortunate enough to witness your metamorphosis, you may be ensured that they will never forget it. This entire principle, carried out in a ritualistic exercise between precast hunter and hunted, is, of course, the basis of such children's games as hide and seek where one child revels in being frightened while the other delights in terrifying, often with both roles interchanging within a single episode of the game. As children are naturally closer to an animal state, so they are well qualified to teach us means by which we might bring ourselves closer. It is the transitional nature of children that makes them ideal teachers. Once your transformation has been effected, Remember, the most profound manifestation can only occur after sufficient buildup. Allow yourself to come down, having retreated, if necessary, to a place where you have unconcernedly dropped to the ground or floor. If you have done your exercise well, you should, upon returning to your normal state, feel the desire to partake of nourishment. The tremendous buildup and discharge of energy in reaching this state will have consumed a vast amount of calories. So the obvious epilogue to your ritual, the completion of the animal cycle, is to eat your fill and go to sleep. Time to start kicking ass. Lest we forget, Satan is the accuser the challenger of moldy opinion and tiresome concepts. In its senescence, Christianity seems to be pulling all its old chestnuts out of the fire and creating the most irrational witch hunt ever. Hysteria is not only heated, but encouraged. Indeed, one wonders about the unquestioning gullibility of not only the general public, but specifically those in positions of authority. Children are enticed not by Satanists, but by the authorities to concoct damaging lies about their own parents. Any star, circle, triangle, hexagram, or octagon becomes a satanic symbol. The list of accused objects grows. Stained glass, ceramic cats, a solid color bathrobe, leather clothes, rock recordings, especially if played backwards, If a satanic Bible is discovered, it becomes proof that its reader perpetrates every crime known to man. If the foregoing lies are challenged and exposed, 
the hysteric, will declare that the exonerated Satanist is not a real or classical, read, Christian variety Satanist who steals babies, molests, and kills children, and chops up animals. The nuts who indulge in the foregoing are repressed hysterics relating wild masturbatory fantasies or jive artists posing as Satanists in order that they may be converted and earn an early parole. Organized groups can never seem to be found because of their secrecy, nor can the bodies of their sacrificial victims. But how they try, oh, how they try. A new profession has appeared, the specialist in the research of the satanic and the occult. Actually, a fancy new name for a hellfire and brimstone preacher. Anyone can hang out his or her shingle as one of these experts. Though, of course, it's more impressive if an insecure asshole has a few letters after his name to prove that he is an authorized, accredited liar. Fear of Satanism is a good way to spice up an otherwise dull and unproductive life. If they can't feel important, at least they can feel righteous in their gutless crusade against a fashionably fiendish enemy. By bringing Satanism to the millions, the most strident and mindless elements from the ruins of Christianity are showing their faces. They are the worst that traditional religion can produce. Now it's time to kick some ass. These remnants of festering Christianity have attempted to place us in a defensive position. When it is our position to demand answers for their irrational behavior. The antics of Satan baiters can only succeed in obscuring the socially redeeming qualities wrought by Christianity's 2,000 year venture. They have not succeeded in giving Satanism a bad name. Quite the contrary. It is Christianity they are besmirching. We do not molest children or sacrifice animals, but it's open season on the kind of creeps who accuse us of doing so. For them, torture is too sweet. For centuries, Satanism has been a paper tiger, a smokescreen, a straw man, perpetuated by the vested interests of Christian dogma. Never before had organized Satanists come forth to challenge the convenient falsehoods Sure, there were the devil's advocates, Tom Paine, Ben Franklin, Shaw, Twain, London, Wells, but they posed little threat to Christianity as a whole. But when you get many thousands of kids cheering real satanic symbols and giving the sign of the horns, now that's a real threat. When a book written by a Satanist, for Satanists, is read, translated, and reread by millions, now that's a threat. The squealing Christian creep is correct in assuming that Satanism is dangerous. It's plenty dangerous, but not because of orgies, infant stealing, animal mutilations, and other unimaginative titillations. Satanism is dangerous because it encourages originality over herd mentality. Large masses of people who all act and think within a prescribed set of options are much easier to control and exploit. The frantic little Christian believes heavy metal is dangerous because it is a convenient target for his hysteria. It's easy to single out Black Sabbath, Motley Crue, Twisted Sister, and all the rest for asinine commentaries. But what about the satanic music of Liszt, Wagner, St. Signs, Beethoven, Mussorgsky, Paganini, and Mendelssohn? Perhaps warning stickers are in order for the works of Cole Porter, Rogers, and Hammerstein, Jerome Kern, and Irving Berlin, whose Stay Down Here Where You Belong features a good guy devil proclaiming You'll find more hate up there than you will down below. 
And what about such tunes as Get Thee Behind Me, Satan, Old Devil Moon, Satan Takes a Holiday, Perfidia, Temptation, Taboo, and Lest We Forget, Frankie Lane or Edith Piaf, Belting out Shanklin's Jezebel. Songs that you can understand. Lyrics you can hear. If a performer were to do a new performance of Jezebel, or Stay Down Here Where You Belong, at a rock concert, it could precipitate a satanic revolution. I must now address the fear of Satanists who view the new dark age with pre trepidation or alarm. Look to our own past influence and future potential to recognize our power. Consider the airtime allocated to evangelists. One can turn on the TV at any time of day or night and receive overtly Christian, read anti-satanic, propaganda. On a lesser level are the investigative reports, anti-satanic, dramatic fictional representations, anti-satanic, factual news coverage, anti-satanic, and spiritually uplifting specials, also anti-satanic. Radio time and printed media are no different. The lower the class of the audience, the more irrational the pitch. As a bait or grabber, Satanism is iconographically employed with formulaic regularity, like a picture of Marilyn Monroe, when in doubt, whack the Slavs with M.M. or Satanism. What might happen if Satanism were given the media time enjoyed by our detractors, or even a tiny fraction thereof? How often have I seen my own image used as a lead-in to an exploitative television segment or an article bearing no resemblance to the concepts I have set forth on no uncertain terms? One must literally stumble upon the Satanic Bible in order to absorb Satanism in its true form. The greatest threat of Satanism is when the truth of it becomes known. If a regularly scheduled Satanic TV show were aired, it would wipe out the flannel-mouthed evangelists overnight. We hold a power so fearsome that it cannot be afforded a voice. Yes, the power is in our hands. We are, more than ever, the accusers. Remember, it is our position, our role, to serve as tribunal to those who pretentiously play-act as nemesis. The thought of answering their accusations, of defending our position, must become an absurdity. Let's put them to the test. Let's interrogate. Let's demand the whys and wherefores of their silly hysterics. We must scourge unreason with inquisitorial intensity and show them the ridicule they deserve. We are not what their old teachers didn't anticipate. There is nothing in their rule books that can contend with real devils that do not succumb to mythic banishments. It's open season. That's it. The Merits of Artificiality Man can easily be fooled. In fact, he has shown every indication that he must be fooled. He complains. It's a Barnum and Bailey world, just as phony as it can be. Yet he won't have it any other way, and seems to survive best under the most artificial conditions. Only when one can fully accept artificiality as natural and often superior development of intelligent life can one have and hold a powerful magical ability? Artificiality is more than completely honest. It forestalls disappointment at things not being what they appear to be. If you know something is phony from the outset, your imagination can make it as real as needs be. But it does require imagination. Believe it or not, everyone has imagination to some degree. Granted, it doesn't take much imagination to be fooled, either by yourself or someone else. But imagination is taken into the realm of creativity, 
when you infuse the unreal with a reality which will be satisfying. Masturbation is the closest most people get to that stage. Unlike the theologies which are dependent upon faith, which raises the debatable into reality, masturbation is based on acts that few can contest. Sexual eradicate its practice.